Is everybody, okay, now I'm on, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Yeah, okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, Gabor again, Kadar, um, and then he will take over introducing the rest of the panel. So um, Gabor, who we heard from earlier from the Rothschild Foundation, Hanadiv Europe, is the director of the Yerusha Project, a digital humanities initiative by the Rothschild Foundation, Hanadiv Europe. And he is a recurrent visiting professor of the Jewish Studies Program at the Central European University, um, formerly in Budapest and now for us, good news, in Vienna. He is a former senior historian of the Hungarian Jewish Archives Budapest. He is the author and co-author of six monographs and numerous studies, articles, encyclopedia entries regarding various aspects of the history of Jews in Hungary, as well as the history of genocide and ethnic violence in Central, Central Europe. He has led and participated in archival research projects for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and Yad Vashem. Dr. Kadar is also a member of the Digital Forum Advisory Board of the European Association of Jewish Studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone uh, back to our uh, second panel. This afternoon uh, we will have four uh, presentations uh, and uh, all of them will focus on or touch upon the question of how to capture individual voices in a larger context, the context of a collection, a spatial context, or, or a historical context, that of Jewish history, and particularly the history of the Holocaust in these cases. Um, I kindly ask everyone to stick to the time frame, of course, uh, and I think we should just get to it. Um, the first presentation will be held by uh, Dr. Ildiku Barna and Alexandra Sabu. Dr. Barna is a sociologist. She's an associate professor and head of the Department of Social Research Methodology at Elta University, Faculty of Social Sciences. She is the co-leader of the Research Center for Computational Social Science, where she is the principal investigator of the Digital Lens Project. Alexandra Sabo is a PhD student at Brandeis University in, Ho in Holocaust history, and she's also a researcher uh, of the Research Center for Computational Social Science. Colleagues, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I have the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having us here today. My name is Alexandra and together with Ildi Kulbana, we are presenting a piece of our ongoing research that for today we title Excavating Voices in a Cross Archival Approach, Dego Testimonies Aligning to ITS Documentation. Our main aim is to understand the movements of Hungarian Holocaust survivors immediately after liberation. This means that we are examining movements inbound and outwards to and from Hungary. We join forces and research interests with Ildiko because she's been researching the external movements that concentrate in displaced persons or DP camps. And I've been interested in the return of Holocaust survivors to Hungary. The main depository that we turn to in order to understand outbound migration is that of the International Tracing Services or ITS documents found in Arlson archives. And for inwards direction, we look at the Degob protocols. Degob is short for, in, in Hungarian, is short for the National Committee for Attending Deportees founded in March, 1945, whose function was threefold. First and most urgently, it was offering aid and relief to recently arrived uh, deportees in Budapest, documentation of all obtained information, and third, sending expeditions to previous concentration and DP camps in order to bring back survivors to Hungary. The importance of documentation was multiple. Among others, it aimed to record the personal experiences of deportees and labor servicemen, to tell basically the history of the Holocaust at an early stage and to provide information about lost relatives. 
The documents that our research at this stage focuses on are the type protocols that are also visible here um, on the slide, which are basically recorded survivor testimonies counting to about 5,000. Through these survivor voices, I've looked into the routes and experiences of arrival back to Hungary, of which the most common directions I drew uh, on a map. Oh, sorry. I drew on a map, a uh, Hungarian map of, in the 1940s. Understanding the typical or unique points about the circumstances of arrival at the borders, on the trains or other means of travel, within Hungary or already within Budapest is generally difficult to achieve because the majority of the protocol narratives end with discussing the moment of liberation. Our aim, however, is to understand the survivors' contemporary context in which they were giving these interviews in Budapest and their future plans of migration. For today, we are presenting our case study of this ongoing research that proves to be not only significant in understanding the historical moment itself, but new methodologies that this research entails. After the Holocaust, approximately 11,000 Hungarian Jews were liberated from forced labor and 60,000 from concentration camps. According to a report from the beginning of the 1946, at least 100,000 Hungarian Jews were expected to emigrate. However, the final number of those leaving the country was much lower than expected, approximately 30,000. There were various reasons behind this relatively low number the high rate of assimilation of surviving Jewry, the communist promise of a country without anti-Semitism, the increasing stability of the Hungarian economy, and paradoxically, the joint enormous financial effort to integrate Jews into the Hungarian society also played a role. However, for those who wanted to emigrate, the increasingly stricter regulations made it more and more difficult. After the 1945 elections, the Ministry of Interior, thus the regulation of emigration, was in the hands of the communists. For some time after the war, they closed a blind eye to border crossing, crossings organized by the Zionists. However, the legal framework for emigration became gradually stricter, leading to a border closure starting in 1949. In part of our presentation, we would like to talk about those who did leave Hungary and applied for assistance. The main concern of the organizations providing care and maintenance was to, de to de de detect the genuine displaced persons and refugees eligible for international assistance. Therefore, the screening of the DP population was necessary. The different organizations have produced changing and increasingly complex rules and regulations. After the war, the main concern was to screen out traitors, quislings, and war criminals. However, later, when new refugees arrived from Eastern Europe, including Hungary, escaping from the emerging communist regimes, officials started to apply the anti-communist criterion. Those Go back, Sandra, <laughs> please, thanks. <laughs> Those uh, who applied for assistance were registered by various organizations depending on the date of application. That's what you see here. In 1947, the IRO, and more precisely, the Preparatory Commission of the IRO, the PCIRO, took over the screening from the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, as it was known, the UNRWA. IRO eligibility officers had a more than 100 page long manual, what you can see here, the front page, and they were expected to be able to catch applicants making false statements. There were problems and discontent on both sides. Displaced persons mistrusted the authorities, feeling that the screening was more a matter of subjective judgment than the objective evaluation of eligibility. IRO screeners faced an extreme workload, and in many cases, they felt that the applicants presented fabricated stories. 
From time to time, it turned out that the supposedly good answers to the questionnaires circulated among the applicants. When authorities applied new restrictions to control the flow of refugees, the stories changed accordingly. As part of the eligibility procedure of the IRO, applicants had to complete a questionnaire referred to as the CM1 form. That's what you see here. The materials on each applicant or family connected uh, to the IRO care and maintenance program were complied in an envelope. That's what you can see on the uh, left side. The CM1 questionnaires on the right side contain various information about the applicants, basic demographics, places of residence, educational and occupational history, language proficiency, information about their lives before and during the Holocaust, as well as their immigration plans. Some question, questionnaires contain long stories about the applicants' lives. So far, we have performed one type of case matching uh, analysis between DAGOB and the CM1 files. In this first cross-examination, we found 13 hits of the complete profile, profiles where after checking various attributes, we can be sure that the person in the DAGOB and in the ITS files are identical. In each matching case, the ITS data complements that of the DIGO protocol, as they are also about the survivors' lives after the Holocaust. Of course, the amount of information depends on how detailed the ITS case file is, which varies considerably. Let's see two examples. Jörg Engel was interviewed in the, in the DEGOP headquarters at Bethlehem there in July 1945. His testimony begins with his forced labor service experience of war in June 1943, and his story ends with his liberation by the American in Ludwig Lust. His account of events is very detailed and full, and full of emotions. However, the CM15 tells us that he was already in labor service in various places from 1940 onwards. His account of the post-liberation period is even more detailed. After returning to Hungary in July, he started to work with his mother in their wholesale glassware shop. Although uh, he wanted to go to university as a so-called class alien, he had no chance. In March 1949, their shop was nationalized, and as he did not want to join the Communist Party or the trade union, he had no opportunities left in Hungary. Therefore, he decided to emigrate and was smuggled out by, by the Bricha. In August, he arrived illegally in Italy, where the IRO registered him. The other example uh, we want to be briefly talk about is Tamás Günzler, who was interviewed by Degob in July 1945, also in the Bethlehem Tier office. His interview is very short. It reveals that not long before his liberation, with two of his fellow prisoners, he escaped and went into hiding. The Americans finally liberated uh, them on May the 8th, 1945. However, more interestingly, it is that his testimony ends, ends with the following sentence. I have a certificate to Palestine. My goal is to emigrate to Palestine. He does not mention Palestine or Israel in his CN1 form as the final destination of his emigration, only Canada. He justifies his decision by saying that his uncle lives there, whose name and address he provides. In the case of Tomasz Künstler, however, we were lucky enough to find his testimony in the USA Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive, which he gave in 1997. The interview reveals that after returning to Hungary, he was there for only three months, and then the Zionists smuggled him out of the country. He was in various DP camps and worked for the UNRWA. He got married, and they emigrated to Canada together in 1948. He also did not mention Palestine here. These examples shows, showed that the cross-examination of various archives often provides new information and contributes to a more detailed and deeper understanding of the life story of a survival. 
However, there are also situations where the gaps and silences in the archival material are of interest. We show now two of them. The case file of Miklós Berger and Imre Berend show that both of them left Hungary entirely out in the reporting of places of residence after liberation. You can see here how they presented their uh, places of, of residence, and you can see that uh, Budapest is not there uh, after the, the Holocaust. This is obviously not the case, however, uh, as from the Degob protocols, we know that they arrived in, to, to Bethlehem Square in Budapest and recounted what had happened to them during the Holocaust. The intention behind this concealment is clear from the details, the different places of residence are listed by month. So we wanted to know what this means. The most obvious reason we could think of why there's no mention of returning to Hungary is to have better chances of obtaining a DP or a refugee status. Other possible explanations include the illegal nature of traveling Although, as Ildiko has explained, that becomes the case after the spring of 1946 and more obviously after 1949. This would mean that after being liberated, the survivor returns to Hungary, stays there for a questionable amount of time, and then eventually leaves to a DP camp. Depending on the survivor's health and information they could or could not obtain, also resulted in multiple movements within the country before finally leaving to emigrate. So the question arises whether this possible movement and chain of decisions is common among those survivors who return and then leave Hungary. If yes, does that mean that there's a common knowledge of eligibility requirements for DPs? And if yes, is there a pattern of silencing the return to Hungary among the Hungarian Jews? Finally, based on Ildi's point that there was information flow between applicants of the DP or, or refugee status, can we actually get closer and construct the pattern or perhaps in an entire network of information behind these silences? Or in other words, is silencing our entrance to understand an undocumented dimension of survivor experience? Our questions remain open for further research, but we still have a significant conclusion that regards the methodological innovations in historical research. The digital means, this is the left side, um, I tried to, to show the connections or the logic um, of, of the digital way of uh, researching. The digital means of approach to archives, knowing that a research sample digitally can be achieved in, in a much greater number than without, easily allows the cross-examination of several archives simultaneously. In our case study here, this meant two archives, or actually three, including the video testimony, but this can be multiplied even further. The dust extracted results, as in our cases, Holocaust survivor voices can also be analyzed through digital means, more specifically through distant reading. This eventually changes the scope of research as it results in a longer trajectory. In our case, understanding a Holocaust survivor's post-war life and decisions further to their experiences of persecution. These are all expected results. But for today, or for our case study here, we also gain knowledge of an unexpected aspect, namely the discovery of a deliberate silencing. This discovery interestingly aligns to a new direction of the historical treatment of silence as a new direction of research discussed by social scientists and historians of slavery here in the US. This direction more informally is referred to as reading against the grain um, and is achieved by historians at Harvard University, NYU, Brandeis University, and other uh, research universities as well. This new emerging field, which I dare say is actually a field or becoming a field, roots the discussion in the concept of social death, a notion also applied by some Holocaust historians. This basically entails the social invisibility and silence of historical subjects, both in history and in the archives, 
In our case, Jews and other persecuted groups during the years of persecution. DPs, as documented survivors, emerge from this state in the immediate post-war period, and if they deliberately silenced or concealed their return to Hungary upon applying for official DP or refugee status, they even have the means to exploit it. So basically, they're exploiting their social death or their social invisibility. Similarly, if Hungary as a point of residence after liberation is left out of the application files, either by the applicant or the officer, um, deliberately or not, it can be considered the first layer of silence according to the trio model which um, historians of slavery use. And in short, this means that an instance of silence informed the studied history. Excavating this silence or finding the silence in the archives thus becomes the ultimate finding to better understand the socio-political process happening at the moment of that history. This silence, even if we are happy to have found it, however, raises significant ethical dilemmas. The question of recovery is the first point, which in our case means that if the survivor or the two survivors that, that we um, specifically showed kept a piece of information, a secret on purpose, especially because it was the survivor's chosen way either to survive, to cope with their survival or to restart a, a new life, how do we as historians treat that and how do we uncover his secret? Researching silences and secrets therefore calls for a new approach to ethics of care, both in the field of history and in the archives, and especially if we use digital um, means to research the multiple archives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Anastasia Felher, who is um, the archivist uh, managing the Slavic collection at the Vera and Donald Blinken Open Society Archives at the Central European University in Budapest. Dr. Felcher, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear audience, and thank you very much for inviting me. It is truly wonderful to be here online, despite the multiple tests and, and everything. All right, so... Um, um, my name is Anastasia Felker, and I work as the archivist for the Slavic, and as I very much hope I will be able to demonstrate in the next uh, 20 minutes, also I work in the Jewish collection at the Vera and uh, Donald Blinken Open Society Archives at the Central European University in Budapest. Now, okay. With this paper, uh, it is my aim to introduce uh, our Jewish Studies archival collection uh, at the Blinken OSA and also to contextualize it um, within the theoretical framework on how um, to highlight, and the challenge actually, of how to highlight Jewish voices in an archival, or in the archival collection, that originally, in fact, is not a Jewish studies archival collection. So parallel to introducing uh, the collection, I also intend to, well, at least initially, at least on uh, surface, to critically reflect on it, both as a researcher, uh, and I specialize in Jewish culture and collective memory of the Holocaust, and also as the archivist who has been closely working with this, this collection for the last year and a half, aiming to increase visibility of Jewish voices within abundance of archival material held at the Blinken OSA. Now, um, as you can see on your screen, in order to uh, while introduce the collection, I will review the temporal and spatial distribution of the documents within the Jewish Studies collection. Um, and um, this is actually an achievement because we haven't been um, do we have been actually doing it quite recently. And now we do um, have an idea of the structure of the collection uh, and the amount of. Um, pages that we actually deal with. I will also address the major topics that the documents refer to and will reflect on archival taxonomy. And uh, I will also introduce specifics of the collection by discussing examples, hopefully I do have time for this, uh, of two research highlights. 
Now, finally, uh, my aim is to inform on the latest effort of archival specialists at the Blinken OSA to reanalyze and recatalog the collection in order to make it accessible for students, researchers, professionals, genealogists, and um, Jewish organizations worldwide. Now, a couple of words about the collection. Um, the Blinken OSA is mostly known as the counter archives that preserves the evidence on the communism, Cold War, and their afterlife, on human rights, and on the complex work of the Open Society Foundation Network. However, it is later known that the Blinken OSA has been presenting and collecting archival material on Central and Southeast European Jewish history since the archives were uh, established in 1995. Now, prior to 1995, this archival collection was, in fact, inaccessible for public, and the reason for this is the fact that the major part of the collection um, consists of the files collected, used, distributed, and archived by the Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty Research Institute that was formerly located in Munich and the Open Media Research Institute formerly located in Prague. Um, thus, originally, uh, the files of these institutes were designed for internal use and the circulation of the staff of the radios and the uh, OMRI. And in 1995, this collection became fully available um, for researchers as a result of administrative and, in fact, political decision after and to a certain extent as the result of the end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the Eastern Bloc and the USSR. Now, at the same time, the fact that the collection became public was closely related to the establishment of the Central European University in Budapest and other cities. And um, as we know, recently, uh, the university has to, had to move again now to here, from Budapest to here, to Vienna. All right, so um, today, the Jewish Studies collection at the Blinken OSA contains about 2,100 folders or items that are dispersed unevenly within 63 archival series under 15 subfonts and five fonts. Now, in fact, the archives, as I already mentioned in the beginning of my talk, does not, does not have the uh, like separate Jewish Studies collection as a separate entity, but rather we do have, as I said, 2,100 around this uh, number folders and items uh, within various archival series along with folders and items on other subjects. Now, this extensive and diversified archival collection forms about Jewish lives in Central and Southeastern Europe from the early 1930s, as I will uh, show in a couple of minutes, uh, through the post-1989 uh, decade, through the eyes of multiple sources, which are largely represented by mass media from both sides of the Iron Curtain. The collection uniquely includes some of the documents and pairs fact with knowledge production about the Jewish population. The collection brings together official and underground primary sources on Jews as ethnic, religious, and intellectual community in Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Yugoslavia, and the Soviet Union, and of course after 1991 in the newly independent states that were formerly um, Soviet republics. All right, so let us see. I think I need to click here. Yes, uh, we'll start uh, with, um, I will not, in fact, read. You can see it on your screen. Uh, we'll start in, uh, with the files that inform uh, about pre-war and wartime uh, lives of the Jewish uh, communities in Romania. But this, I mean, all this is details, if you're interested, is available in our archival catalog, so I will not stop on this here. Um, the next, so this would be like part one. The next, and uh, these, um, uh, this material, what's, uh, it's a later addition to the collection, as well as the next part, and this is Holocaust uh, interview collection. This is Julia um, White, the totalitarianism and Holocaust uh, interview collection, contains more than uh, 430 or 36 digital items, which are, well, the interviews, um, this is also a later addition to the collection, uh, later than 1995. And then, uh, as um, I tried to show here on the screen, in fact, this uh, series, this collection, is described in, pre in details, So, and um, you might access it once you're in our research room and this is available um, in digital form. 
Now, the next part, so part three of the Jewish Studies collection, would be um, actually the most, um, not problematic, but I would say interesting part of it. And these would be uh, files that are kept within the records of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty Research Institute. And what I was trying to do for this uh, presentation, for this workshop, is to actually um, figure out, so what uh, is the percentage, what is the distribution in terms of how um, many files we actually have, again, in, in percents, on um, the years and on uh, uh, the countries. And, well, it's not in fact surprising that the majority of the files cover the Soviet Union, not only due to, well, <laughs> the, um, the fact that it was a, in fact pretty spatial country itself, um, but also because the Radio for Europe and Radio Liberty uh, Research Institute held um, some of that archives. And they were not only collecting, but they were also uh, printing uh, and uh, publishing and um, um, dispersing, um, well, political summons that basically information about uh, persecution of dissidents in the Soviet Union, including the Jews, um, back to the Soviet Union in the and uh, to the West in the bulletins that were materials of summons that and, um, 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 yeah, documents summons that. Okay. So if we go to the fourth part of the collection, we see there that it is in fact very similar. And as you see, it's also about clippings, abstracts, and media reports that were produced under the, under the Open Media Research Institute. Um, and then again, here, we do have a um, majority of items on the Soviet Union. However, uh, the difference between the third part and the fourth part is that here we, we do see transcripts um, of monitoring and the national television and radio broadcasts. Now, the final part, and this is also the um, something that came later, uh, is the records of International Health and Federation of the Human Rights. Here we don't see that many folders or items, and it's also about the um, 80s and 90s. Anyhow, um, uh, it is worth going through them. So let us um, discuss, in fact, what are the major topics? So what's, what is this collection about? Now, while it is obvious that part one and part two of the collection inform about pre-war Jewish lives in Romania and, and the Holocaust in Hungary, and Romania as well, part uh, three to five of the collection, in fact, contain information about, as I tried to show it, several countries in the region. And folders items are under this RFERL and um, OMRI and IHF, archival fonts and form on complex post-war Jewish experience in Central and Eastern Europe, including, as I demonstrated, the Soviet Union. Now, the main categories under which uh, the folders or items on Jewish topics are coded, archived, or archived are Jews as minority group, anti-Semitism, nationalism, Jewish associations, societies, unions, and organizations, Judaism, Zionism, emigration, uh, official policy of the states towards emigration, and basically refusal to let people go, biographies, protests, Jewish samizdat, and Jewish revival under communism. Now, these categories um, of the archival taxonomy are rather broad and general, and in fact, a lot of details about the contents of the folders remain to be hidden till the very moment when the users and researchers start the actual work um, with the documents and archival boxes in our research room. And thus the actual content of the archival folders um, is much richer than the categories originally designed to categorize this material. Um, also, this collection is unique as it brings together mass media evidence from both sides of the Aaron Carton. And by doing uh, so, the collection uncovers not only transnational specifics of Jewish experiences in the region, um, especially when it concerned emigration advocacy or collective memory. But the collection also allows tracing which narratives were marginalized, and this of course is very topical for the collective memory of the Holocaust in the region, um, and, or were overlooked in the countries of the Eastern Bloc and the USSR, and which efforts, if any of course, were taken in other parts of the world to have these narratives um, disclosed or uh, discussed publicly. 
Now, also, if one analyzes the contents of the folders beyond the factual information um, that you know the document um, inform us about, one will have a chance to trace the very logic and methods of mass media communication in the Cold War, because then, when broadcasting on private cases, it was um, the mass media unavoidably packed um, this information in the logic of informational confrontation within bipolar world. Now, there is also a very specific challenge uh, that the researcher working with or uh, on this archival studies collection as primary source will uh, unavoidably encounter, and this challenge is, um, has to do with, with the topic of um, this workshop, is finding Jewish voices. Among subject files and biographical files that report on Jewish lives in the region, but as I mentioned previously, within this collection, one often gains information about Jewish lives through the lens of mass media communication or through the well, eyes and uh, work of researchers as the, at the RFERL uh, or other institutions. And these researchers were producing research or background reports. Now, with the exception of one series, and this is published some of that, we in fact rarely encounter Jewish voices directly. However, as well, I still have time. I will show the example of items on Raoul Wallenberg. Uh, within abundant material of the collection, one still may reveal, well, if not direct Jewish voices, but complex agency of Jewish public actors. Now, let's see what we have on Wallenberg. And in fact, this is all um, scanned, digitized, and available online. So um, if uh, you're like me, willing to spend your Sundays uh, with archival materials. You can easily do, the, do this. And we do have something about more than uh, 2,000 pages that are, again, dispersed in different um, archival series, which I showed here, um, which I listed here. Now, what is this collection about? What it, um, uh, or thematic highlight, it does contain um, mass media reports from the Times, the Spiegel, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, Welt, uh, Die Welt, Washington Post, Economist Today, International Herald Tribune, The Atlantic, and so on and so forth. So um, majority of documents on Wallenberg, in fact, aspire from Western media, which is a very rare case in the Jewish Studies collection at the Blinken OSA since, well, as I mentioned before, usually we have it from the both sides of the Iron Curtain. So I, it is my understanding that on the one hand, it may be explained that the Soviet media was actually silencing the case of Wallenberg, and on the other hand, well, it may be explained by the source selection principle of, of the radios. Now, um, I will, I think I will not have much time to comment on the documents, I'll just show you what it is. Some of it is in Russian, but um, this is from 1964, so what is in Russian, I'll just go very quickly, and then we'll go back. This is the very first document that we have. Uh, and this is Swedish Ministry of the Foreign Affairs. Um, I was just um, highlighting uh, the um, points that I find uh, fascinating. I'll just uh, continue describing uh, what we have just while showing you the documents. I'll just leave it here. Now, um, the documents reveal transnational agency and diplomatic effort in the US, Sweden, Western countries, and Israel to release Wallenberg or at least to gain information about his fate. And based on this collection, we may reconstruct uh, distribution or, or rumors or claimed evidence from the USSR on the Wallenberg location and how intensely the international community and diplomats reacted on all these rumors or potential news. Now, we may also reconstruct the, the progress of international or universal recognition of Wallenberg's assistance to the Hungarian Jews in 1944, and um, which was developing, in fact, in close connection to international recognition of the Holocaust itself. So I'll just, okay, fine, it's in Russian, sorry. Uh, okay, that's in English, so I'll just keep, uh, keep, yeah, keep showing you. Now, from the 1960s and 1980s, the Western media continuously treated the Wallenberg case as a test um, for, through which the Soviet relations with the Western world may be tested. And with the, um, in the second half of the 1980s and with the policy of perestroika and glasnost, uh, in fact, international media addressed Gorbachev and said that, well, 
Glass, uh, Wallenberg remains to be a glasnost forgotten one, um, hinting that if, the, if Gorbachev was really serious about it, he would um, disclose information on Wallenberg. Um, now, as for Jewish voices, uh, in this thematic highlight, uh, we rarely encounter them directly, as I already mentioned. Now, only in the cases of emigrated Soviet Jews who claim they saw Wallenberg alive in the Soviet prisons, in the camps, uh, in the gulag, or mental health facilities, or the dissidents that were accusing uh, Brezhnev of direct involvement in the uh, abduction of the Swedish diplomat, other Jewish voices in this story are representatives of international Jewish organizations who were advocating for the release um, of Wallenberg. Now, let me go for, uh, how do I do it? Sorry, mm -hmm. I think I do it this way. Um, I would like to discuss another thematic highlight, and I still have time for this, wonderful. Um, and this is a challenge uh, to commemorate the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, and in the case of Babi Yar in Kiev, also several attempts in commemoration we could see uh, through the documents in the late 1960s, early 1980s, and early 1990s. I think I will show you, uh, yeah, mostly in this series we can find them. I will show you uh, several documents, but I will, don't have time to actually comment on it. Now, this thematic lives brings uh, multiple voices to the forefront um, of international uh, agenda. And he, the, you, you see here documents from the case of Boris Kachubievsky from Kiev. I don't have time to actually go through this, very sorry. Now, anyhow, um, uh, he was the one who wrote uh, in and distributed in Samizdat uh, a reaction for the Six Day War uh, and also claimed that, in fact, uh, victims that were shot in Babinyar in Kiev were of Jewish identities. For this, he was persecuted. And then we have um, a very detailed account in a published summons that of how it happened. Um, there, sorry, that's in Russian, because actually the majority of this collection on the Soviet Union will be in Russian and English. Um, but what is interesting is that um, based on what the radios were produced, as published some of that, we could see the immediate reaction of the Western media and also uh, referring to the case um, basically in, in the several months. Um, all right, so let me uh, very briefly then uh, discuss um, how we are contributing to the collection's uh, visibility. Okay, I don't have time, but I'll try to be very, very quick. Now, um, the Blinken OSA was trying um, to provide open access to its collection from the moment of the archive's opening. And nowadays, the catalogs and parts of the collection are available online. Now, um, for the archivist at the Blinken OSA, it is highly important to preserve not only the files, but also the authenticity of the cat categories assigned to the archival material. And um, as I already mentioned, yes, these categories are rather broad, but at the same time, um, we, uh, we don't introduce the changes there, but we add um, keywords and um, personal and geographical um, tagging. So um, last year, we also finished compiling the full list of folders and items related to Jewish topics. And um, it is also our plan to turn this into the new FindNate, or as we call it, reference information paper. And as a partial response to the new reality brought uh, to all of us by the COVID-19 crisis, we also uh, introduced digitization on demand, and we do have plans for the curated collection, which hopefully will increase uh, digital availability of this complex um, archival collection. Thank you, I'm very sorry. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, our next presentation uh, will take us to Budapest again. Uh, it will be by Dr. Helena Huhag, who is an assistant research fellow in the Institute of History of the Research Center for the Humanities, and Dr. Andras Sechenyi, who is a research fellow in the Historical Archives of the Hungarian State Security in Budapest, and both of them are acknowledged scholars of the Holocaust in Hungary. Colleagues, over to you. 
Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having us uh, this very important conference. I will start our pre presentation and uh, Andras will continue. <clears throat> okay. So. Okay. So the title of our presentation is the Holocaust Memorial Center's collection and its context. In our presentation, we would like to highlight the Holocaust Memorial Center's collection, which is Hungary's only public collection dedicated exclusively to the history of the Holocaust. Our findings are based primarily on our own experiences because we both had been employed in the Holocaust Memorial Center as museologists until 2017. And uh, first of all, we have to admit that the uh, collection has little to do with the panels thematic because this collection has been basically not a digital collection until today. And we will actually uncover the reasons behind this. And we will talk about uh, reflecting to the title of the panel, not new, rather unknown materials. And uh, among these, the reasons and the consequences of the lack of digitalization. So the first part of uh, the lecture summarized the history of the Holocaust Memorial Center of the past with special regard to the development of its collection. The other part tries to explore some significant questions in connection with the collection's work and its possibilities. The Holocaust Memorial Center is a state museum which, uh, according to its funding charter, collects, preserves, exhibits, and researches, docu documents, testimonies, photos, artifacts, and objects of those who suffered racial, ethnic, and or political persecution before and during the Second World War, or were involved in the rescue. From the 1960s onwards, the communist Kadar regime was ambivalent about the memory of the Holocaust. It wasn't allowed to appear the public freely and restricted to the territory of the private memory. In 1957, the Communist State Party that decided to institutionalize the documentation and propaganda of the anti-fascist freedom fighters and also on the fa fascist victimized groups. The establishment of the National Committee of Persons Persecuted by Nazism in Hungary, the Nazi Mushudetainek Bizottság in Hungary, Within the framework of the Hungarian Partisan Association became the first organization in Hungary which started to document and collect the historical sources of the Holocaust. However, they did it in a very unprofessional way as Holocaust was perceived as one part or one area of the anti-fascist left-wing freedom fight against the Nazis. After the regime change of 1989, Hungarian Auschwitz Foundation Holocaust Memorial Holocaust Documentation Center was established just in 1990 by survivors and civil people. The private foundation was supported and sponsored by companies, banks, and individuals. The foundation uh, was the first organization that considers its task not only to research the history of the genocide, but also to collect the relevant documentation. As part of this goal, they assimilated some of the relevant materials of the National Committee of Persons Persecuted by Nazism as well. In 1991, the Auschwitz Foundation published calls in the press to collect written and tangible memories, asking survivors to write their memoirs or say them on tape. In the 1990s, there was an even larger number of survivors who could be interviewed and gather first-hand or background information. The 2000s Holocaust Museum as exhibitions have appeared independently of Jewish museums across Europe, for example, in London, Paris, or Berlin, presenting the Holocaust as a European historical event as part of general history. Susan Sontag defined this new type of museum as a separate category, memory, as memory museum. This type of museum was developed in uh, memory of the dis, uh, destruction of European Jews, but the pattern can also be used to process the history of other modern genocides and to mourn its victims. In 2001, Hungarian government also 
preparing for the 60th anniversary of the deportations, determined to establish a public museum for the research and collection work of the Hungarian Holocaust. In order to reach these goals, the Holocaust Documentation Center and Memorial Collection Public Foundation was established by the state in 2002. The Auschwitz Foundation and its documentation merged into the foundation by this step. In the end of, uh, in the end, in 2004, Holocaust Memorial Center was established as a state museum operating by the public foundation. In the award-winning award museum era, its permanent exhibition titled From Deprivation to Rights of Genocide opened its doors to visitors two years later. During the 2000s, there was much critical attention paid to the museum architecture, exhibitions, location, name, the lack of mission statement, public roles, and its constantly uh, redefined functionally and concepts of leadership, etc. One of the major problems was that there was no clear concept behind the museum. The charter documents of the public foundation did not include the classification of the institution. It was not clear what its function was, museum, documentation center, memorial site. The lack of consumption generated unambiguous appellations. We are not going to highlight these problems in the following. Uh, instead of this, we are going to focus exclusively on the collection. Both the Memorial Center and its predecessor, the Hungarian Auschwitz Foundation, were faced with the same problems from the 1990s up to 2011 regarding the collection work. There were no qualified full-time staff members to collect and register the materials received. Typically, the foundation employed retired survivors and social workers without archival or museological background. Unfortunately, the chair of the foundation and then the directors of the museum were not experts on this field or just simply, simply did not have any concept for managing the museum works and they kept misleading the collection works as well by their managerial decisions. Being not a central issue is also shown by the fact that no storage was planned for the rapidly increasing collection. They did not create collection plans to regulate and control the collecting works and methods, or the processes of donations, and the directors did not develop a software database either. It wasn't just a lack of concept, but the management of the museum sometimes didn't interested in collecting and preserving the ego documents of the genocide at all. In 2004, the director of the museum defined the institution as a public collection that does not uh, aim to collect items systematically in order to preserve them. In general, between 2002 and 2010, the management of the museum did not take much attention to the collection. Because of the above mentioned managerial decisions, the collection work was run by ad hoc conceptions. The biggest problem was the pure registration, registration during the collection process. The collection staff continued to collect any material they could but did not make documentation, including the full identification and description of each object, its associations, provenance, condition, treatment, and location. The, that, the data regarding the donations and the former owners were usually not noted at all. The lack of documentation was causing great losses in the historical value of these ego documents handed over by the donators. These negative circumstances affected most seriously the object and the visual sources, as it is hard to contextualize these types of sources in the lack of written documentation. In addition, the number of original objects in the permanent exhibition, which opened in 2016, is negligible, and they are for illustrative purposes only. And I would like to add the floor to Andres. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. In the sum, thank you. I'd like to continue. In the summer of 2010, a new year began. The new director, Laszlo Harshani, started to develop the collections department. The museum launched the proactive collecting strategy program and started to employ professional museologists. A new compact stack room was built in 2011. 
the management introduced annual collection campaigns, which proved successful and had lasted until the recent years. And last but not least, a new inventory software was developed for keeping a record of every document, object, images, and testimonies. Despite of this uh, fact, the acquisition of the Memorial Center had several difficulties in recent years. The so-called proactive collecting method meant mainly some call of donations every year, year by year, around um, the Holocaust Memorial Day. The systematic acquisition or purchase or a well-planned collection development program has been missing in this collecting strategy since then. Uh, the Holocaust Memorial Center was getting popular in the, in the 2010s, which influenced the willingness of Jewish families to donate their Holocaust-related family documents to the museum. By the expanding... Uh, 3,000 new donors, primarily Holocaust survivors and descendants, donated their family materials until today. We have to mention that the political environment had influenced the donators in many cases. According to our experiences, the survivors of their or their relatives have often no concrete ideas about what to do with their private documents and other materials they have. Some families hesitate a lot. They don't want to give their documents or documentations to the state institution because of the governmental policy regarding the Holocaust. Uh, unfortunately, since 2014, the museum has returned to negligent collections management which uh, the museum left behind in 2010. Uh, in total, the museum has processed about 13,000 items in the inventory so far. The donators donated several thousands of photos and personal documents in, the digital, in digital format as well. All this is completed by a repository of data collection, which contains valuable background information. This talk represents of personal life and family stories that does not serve as an important supplement for the event of the public history, but represents personal narratives of the Hungarian Holocaust. There have been several explorations, summaries about the problems and anomalies around the research and memory of the Holocaust in Hungary for the last two decades, uh, and on the memory politics of the current government related to the, Hung uh, related to the Holocaust and the genocide since 2010. These investigations focus on the relatively low international visibility of the Holocaust scholarship, and the poor state of institu institutionalization, the infrastructural shortcomings, the unavailability of recent Holocaust literature in Hungarian libraries, and last but not least, the inaccessibility of archival documentation to the English-speaking public. Another problem which affects specifically this collection is the role of ego documents in current researches. However, there has been an increasing interest in the ego documents of the persecuted Jews from the early 2000s. These kind of sources remained underrepresented in Holocaust historiography. The survivors' documents, diaries, memoirs, letters, photos, and objects had been mostly not part of this discussion so far, and we find only very weak efforts that pay attention to the historical value of the, the ego documents of the Holocaust, of the complex family sources. We can see the dominance of the documents produced by perpetrators instead of the personal sources of the victims and survivors. Sometimes a fragment of a deported family story can be shown by objects. This porcelain tea, Tea set made in Karlsbad, now Czech Republic, and was owned by the Müller family from Oika. 
At the time of the ghettoization, they thought that these family values would be handed to their neighbors, a Christian family for temporary safekeeping. The Mullers didn't return home after the war, but the Christian family preserved their tea set and donated to the museum in 2011. Uh, we are also aware of the slowly increasing number of research results using narrative sources of this unique collection. One of the latest significant books is Regina Fritz's epic source book, Die Verfolgung und Ermordung der Europäischen Juden durch das Nationalsozialistische Deutschland, uh, volume 15. But uh, we have to admit that our own research's findings are based on these narrative sources. And we also edited the collection catalog of the Holocaust Memorial Center's collection. And we published both in it, both, both in Hungarian and English languages. Another context of the collection is the field of accessibility and availability. Between 2011 and 17, Every single item was registered and described in the digital filling system of the museum called Museum Sys. This database, such as the digitalized items, is not public, not available online. Consequently, researchers tend to neglect the collection. This way, the collection of, uh, of, of the center can hardly be a source base for foreign, for, for foreign researchers. Due to the low level of publication of the items and the lack of translations, the non-Hungarian authors are not able to research many sources and just keep referring to the same few known testimonies that we have already published in English. It's no surprise that the collection of the, memo the Memorial Center is still underrepresented among Hungarian public collections and in the historiography as well. However, we are both certain, certain, certain of using ego documents and family materials could only give answers to many questions regarding the Holocaust. That's not, last but not least, we would like to mention another aspect which the museum should deal with. We are getting closer to the post-witness era. That is why the number of possible new narrative sources is getting decreasing. From this aspect, making the collection available online and the digitalization will be more important in the next years. Overall, the main goal should be to make the collection visible and accessible. These processes can increase the influence of museological collections on historical scholarship if we found change, if we would change the, the way how to use the museum collections in historical research, we could maybe fill some gaps in the personal stories of the Holocaust, but vice versa, the collecting practices of the museum would also change significantly. We think that uh, exploring and examining of the museum collections uh, we cannot integrate the stories of the, of the about five or 6,000 Hungarian deportees into the history of the Holocaust and into the growing corpus of the academic studies, uh, which analyze and acknowledge the importance of the victims' documents. The processing of the collection would not only offer little known and, sig in, and significant sources to the historical discourses on the genocide, but it would certainly enrich it with new approaches and aspects due to the social and cultural background of the Hungarian Jews and the historical peculiarities of the Hungarian Holocaust. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our last presentation of the panel is a truly collaborative one. Uh, from the uh, St. Pölten University. And it will be delivered by um, Georg Vogt, who is a researcher, author, editor, filmmaker, and creator, Alexander Rindt, 
uh, who is also a researcher at the St. Bolton University of Applied Sciences. Theresa Eichstein, who is a researcher uh, of the project and has studied theater, film, and media studies at the University of Vienna. Birgit Peter, the director of the archive and collections of the Department of Theater, Film, and Media Studies at Vienna University. And Clemens Baumann, a research assistant at the Institute of Creative Media Technologies at the St. Bolton University of Applied Sciences. Colleagues, the floor is yours. Well, thank you all for having us here and setting up this great event. I think you'll speak on behalf of all of us that we are very happy to be among people again. Um, we are a collaborative effort, uh, although only three of us made us today, so sorry if we I'll let us down after this introduction. It's uh, me, uh, Georg Fuck from the University of Applied Science St. Bolton, and together with uh, Birgit Peter and Teresa Eckstein of the University of Vienna. Have I successfully shared my slides? Yes, I have. So best regards on behalf of the rest of the team, and today we'll give you a small insight into our research project, Video Biograph. We conduct this together for the Loire Austrian uh, Funding Agency uh, for Science. Uh, it's a collective effort of two universities, and it runs for three years, and we are now halfway through the project, so we can kind of give you an outlook what we already accomplished, what ar archives we are based upon, and what we are trying to achieve in this project. So. Let's proceed. So what is the, uh, the project about? So we are working in the spaces of local memorial culture, archives, and citizen science. So it's a, uh, it, the, uh, we uh, try to set up a prototypical regio biograph, which is supposed to be a software that creates filmic narrations based on data sets in regional context. And when I say regional, I mean a regional community archives like the Heimat Museum we have in Austria. That means the smallest kind of museum you can have in a village that is usually run by amateur archivists and that has, doesn't have a lot of uh, so, uh, institutional uh, power or uh, working power. So we, our project is based on two case studies, and today we'll just talk about one, which is the Jewish community of Groß Enzersdorf. Uh, the Jewish community of Groß Enzersdorf was one on 15 Jewish communities in Lower Austria that existed uh, for about 100 years until it, as all of the others, I think it doesn't exist any longer. It was extinct in the 30s during the Shoah. And, uh, uh, our project combines historic research, that's one aspect, with data visualization. So we are technical university, so we do a lot of data visualization. Uh, and I'm coming from film and media theory, so we also try to get montage principles into our project and try to find ways to convey the archive in uh, ways of time-based media. So what we're actually after is a narration, and we see ourselves in a long line of efforts that actually started, didn't start that far back. The, the history of the Jewish community was mostly neglected until the early 2010s, and one of the first projects that picked up on the history of uh, the community was an exhibition in 2013. Yes, um, and this remarkable, remarkable step happened in 2013, when this exhibition about the Jewish community took place in Groß Enzersdorf. Uh, this exhibi exhibition was initiated by Martin Sommerlechner, the city councillor uh, for culture of the Green Party um, of Groß Enzersdorf. The basis for this exhibition was the source research of the private researcher, Ida Olga Höfler, you can see her, and her work, uh, the Jewish Gemeinden, im Weinviertel und ihre rituellen Institutionen 1848 bis 1938, 45, published in 2015. Um, these, these five extensive volumes collect basic information on Jews in the Weinviertel, which consists of recording names, life data, genealogical data, professions, property, and addresses. Höfler's uh, source materials were mainly land registers, cemeteries, scattered municipal archives and reports from contemporary witnesses. And this important work by the private researcher is not digitally available. Um, 
uh, recorded. The visibility and sustainable use of data are not yet given. The knowledge about the Jewish history of course ancestors is still on, only peripherally available in the locality. And there are two contemporary witness reports have come um, down to us. The one uh, first is Erich Katz, uh, The Days and Nights of the Nazi Terror, 19, uh, 1938-39. It's written in the 1990s. And from his father, Karl Katz, the Israelitische Kultusgemeinde von Groß Enzersdorf, published 1971 in Geschichte der Juden in Österreich von Hugo Gold. Um, for example, now, the case study of the history uh, of the synagogue in Großenzersdorf. Um, until 2020, a fellow land was visible behind the garden fence at Kaiser Franz Josef Straße 11 in Großenzersdorf. Next, please. On the fence, there was a remembrance board. Next. Um, The text on it starts with the following words. You don't see anything there. The same applies to the Jewish community in Groß Enzersdorf. They no longer exist. The synagogue designed by the Viennese architect Jakob Gartner in 1898 was the first public place of prayer in Groß Enzersdorf. In October 1938, Karl Katz, head of the Jewish community, was forced to donate the property to the club leader of the German Gymnastics Federation Groß Enzersdorf and senior teacher Hans Krüppmannsberger. The synagogue was devastated in November 1938. The only thing that could be saved was the Torah mantle, which is now in the depot of the Jewish Museum Vienna. In 1953, the synagogue and property were restituted to the Jewish community Vienna. At first, they planned to build a rest home for needy Jewish children, including a park and memorial. By now, we don't know why that didn't happen. In 1960, the Jewish community Vienna decided to demolish the dilapidated synagogue. In 1965, the builder Herbert Gangel from Probstdorf was commissioned with demolition work. He employed community workers who demolished the synagogue on weekends and could take bricks for building their own houses with them as additional payment. The building material was also sold by him. In 1990, the property was sold by the Jewish community. A memorial plaque was installed in 1996. In 2019, the site was sold to the construction company Glorit. Right now, Glorit started to sell the apartments in a new built house. The remembrance board disappeared despite an agreement with the community that it should be preserved. At the moment, there is no visible memory of the synagogue in Groß Enzersdorf, but there are visible traces of appropriation windows that were installed in a hay barn, fragments of a history of appropriation. The only visible remnant of Jewish life in Groß Enzersdorf is the Jewish cemetery. Our project researches traces of the history of the Jewish community and uses digital methods to develop a broad perceptible narrative. Um, the focus is on the following questions. How can stories be told from the archives and media artifacts? Which connections can be conveyed as a narrative? How can new links be built? The aim is uh, to make the stories accessible to interested users and to encourage them to deepen historical knowledge and understanding in a participatory manner. What are the local archives that we have Where am I told about the history of the Jewish community? Our aim is to deepen and contextualize the initial data from Ida Olga Höfler and the eyewitness reports from Erich Katz and Karl Katz. At first, we start to in-depth research through archives, 
and databases, such as, just to name some, the Wiener Stadt- and Landesarchiv, the Österreichische Staatsarchiv, Niederösterreichisches Landesarchiv, and so on. And also family archives, as uh, someone already mentioned today. These are very important for us if we find them. Then databases such as Georg? Georg? Yes. <laughs> um, Genteam.at, Findbuch, Findbuch für Opfer des Nationalsozialismus, Yad Vashem, um, Holocaust CZ, and just to name some of them. Um, at second is the inclusion of the data in our database, which is developed parallel to the research and evaluation of the data. Another important step is the contextualization via documentary film recordings. We are searching for central places of Jewish life, the synagogue, the Jewish cemetery, residential buildings and addresses of the Jewish population. These places and traces are recorded as documentary film material. While visiting these places, we focus on the following questions. State of the location, for example, an overgrown cemetery with fallen stones, fading lettering, and garbage storage at the cemetery. We visit former homes of the Jewish populations. We film the stones of memory in front of some of the buildings. And also very important are our interviews with eyewitnesses. We interviewed a married couple from Groß Enzersdorf in the 90s who have lived on the property behind the synagogue since the 1960s. On the other hand, we interviewed a retired doctor who was smuggled out of the ghetto in Kovno as a child and survived through hiding by a Lithuanian family and has lived in Groß Enzersdorf since the 1980s. We interviewed a Jewish resident from Groß Enzersdorf who fled to Australia. And also, we interviewed Ida Olga Höfler. Yes, so um, regarding archives, most of what we told you yet were kind of analog archives or the, data, the databases Teresa mentioned. And there's one interesting development in uh, the local uh, uh, remembrance uh, context that uh, arose shortly before our project. So in Lower Austria, I don't know how many of you know there's topotheques, but they have kind of expanded in the last decade, and it's kind of a citizen science principle that allows uh, people of villages or towns to uh, set up their own data sets. And it's a quite basic system. You can enter uh, data sets, uh, usually media artifacts. You can enter documents, videos, audio files, or photographs. And you can align them uh, in a timeline and on a map. So that was kind of the first effort in uh, in course, and sort of to set up uh, a group of people who kind of uh, considered what should be entered into those into this archive. And the interesting uh, one interesting aspect of this is that as you start to enter and uh, a, a data sets, you notice that some questions arise basically automatically. So you see the synagogue, which does no longer exist, which is kind of present and raises interesting questions and. The, in all of those sets, you start to recognize that there was a Jewish community in Groß Enzersdorf because there are remnants of their existence scattered all around town. So that becomes apparent, and one of the basic ideas of a video biograph was to narrate the story of the community in the setting of the city's history by combining data sets that concern them. So they. And as we. Uh, Heard there was this exhibition in 2013, and uh, one interesting aspect of this was the several layers of the historic uh, documents that we have. But here, for example, you see uh, Therese already mentioned uh, the Katz family, and here you see uh, a letter that we uh, found, among other material, that uh, the son of Karl Katz, Erich Katz, sent to the mayor in 2005 in reaction to the city's failure to uh, uh, make the report public. That uh, was one uh, issue that already wasn't settled. And when you need to see this uh, document, you recognize, see that uh, the village finally uh, put it in its city journal, but they contextualize it with two paratexts. One is uh, a general take on history by the major himself. Then there is the cuts text on uh, 
on the pogrom, and the last text is a text of a soldier that contextualizes the war history from that side. So you can see history politics of Austria in, in those uh, documents, and it's an interesting challenge how we kind of contextualize and frame it in, in our project. This is the second part where you can see the, the report of Erich Katz ending, and then you see the memories of a soldier, and you, I don't think I have to go into detail about the history politics common in Austria. Uh, up to that time, yes, and so we have a number of uh, documents that kind of uh, move our history beyond the presence of the Katz family in Grosentersdorf, but prolong the story and tell it from different perspectives from, from abroad and deliver interesting context. So, uh, as I said, we are trying to set up different narrating models for our themes, and uh, the most basic model we have is the linear narration of a biography of a person, and to conduct those narrations, we had to come up with a database, which is a kind of media wiki that we set up for, for our cases, and as you can see, we, we kind of had to come up with categories. So we have uh, birth dates, we have central events on so the life of people, and we can link all of those aspects to uh, media files that we create. So we have oral history interviews that tell us of uh, certain events. We have documents that, uh, that play a role in those narrations, and all those documents will be linked to those entries in the next step. So we'll have his biography, and we'll have all these uh, documents, and we'll have the media files, and the reach biograph will assemble them in a linear fashion. And this is just an example of the material we work with in, in his case. So we have both the, the time in school, we have documents from the school. So another aspect of the project is that you will see the Jewish community in context of the school of other pupils. Uh, we'll have documents uh, as he was forbidden to study in Vienna. We have Ida Olga Höfler who told us of her correspondence with him, which is of course a later time frame that we also have to enter there. We have his report and we have uh, different materials to, that was made with or about him. So this goes on until his death, which was in Troy near New York. So this is kind of the, the part we're working on now, assembling a, a linear narration on, on some of our community members. And we will expand it to different kinds of narration, so we'll have, we will be able to navigate this. And the final uh, goal of the project is to make this available in the local memorial context, so you can, uh, over an interface, access those stories. And as more people can enter data sets into the system, we hope that it will grow and uh, become a bigger self-telling archives that uh, also uh, kind of um, lead to more engagement or uh, uh, more community work. So uh, this is just an issue of uh, so the, the complexi complexity of telling it as, as a time-based media, because we also have to uh, think about how can we get geographical information in that if you automated, people move from city to city, they get deported. So we have, if you want to tell that they move elsewhere, we have to come up with, with uh, ways to narrate that. Uh, and we have to kind of come up with abstract timelines, and uh, we also dealing with issues of should we use sound, shouldn't we use sound, how do you, do we need info blocks on certain historical events that uh, are not self-explaining, and so on. Uh, well, yes, that would be kind of the, the part where we are at the moment, and yes, so the the goal of the project is to provide complex narrations that generate from the expanding database. So, of course, uh, we strive to uh, get visibility of marginal stories and people in the local context, and we want to relate those different historical layers to each other by establishing a network of relations. And so, overall, we're kind of offering or trying out a narrative approach on, the, on the archive exploration. I think that would be what we wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our panel today, and now the floor is open for questions. There are questions? Maybe we'll collect again. So I have Sonia, Hannah, and Natalia. And Gabor, if you want to collect collection questions in the chat and read them if there are any. Sure. Okay, so Sonia? 
Yeah, so I'm Sonia Gallant, uh, UCL, and my question's actually for the people who are at the front of the room. So um, I'll be like this. <laughs> All right, okay, I will do that. Um, which is great because this is actually movement related. Um, so I couldn't help but notice that, noticed that several of you are involved in performance studies in theater and dance, and I was wondering, all right. I was wondering if in your, um, in your work on this project, if you had any interest in um, trying to document the performance culture of your subjects. Thank you. Keep the performance culture off. Performance cu culture of your, of your subjects. Like what sort of dancing or theatrical performance or other sorts of like live entertainment or things of that nature, not just you know, the buildings or the biographies, but also this sort of artistic expression. We'll collect questions and then, yeah, maybe they're related. Thank you. My question is to Ildiko and Alexandra. If you uh, use any softwares for your research, and if yes, how do you use them? And one small remark to Anastasia about Babi Yar. Uh, it should be either Russian way, Babi Yar, or English way, B A B I, or Ukrainian Babin Yar, but <laughs> just small <laughs> remark. <laughs> and actually, the question if you can tell something about particular this collection, Babin Yar. Uh, there was there together with Wallenberg, and he didn't say anything about it. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Natalia Alexion. So I have questions for everybody in a way. I, I'm, uh, this was fascinating, and I'm puzzled by this concept of self-telling archive. Uh, just in practice, I'm assuming that this is public history especially that interests you. Uh, is there an idea of someone administering it? Is there going to be some kind of you know, academic overseer, or is it really sort of a going to be a body that has a life of its own. If you could comment on this. Uh, on the, no, I don't know how to pose my question to the session that was completely online, uh, to uh, the um, uh, Holocaust Memorial Center's collection uh, in, in Hungary. I wonder if you could uh, comment a little bit more about the agency of donors the extent to which you mentioned the fact that they are hesitant about the political context, but how, to what extent they can push for things, beginning with space for collecting, which was not originally uh, planned. And for Ildiko and Alexandra, thank you so much for this. Uh, I was wondering about not just pattern in silences, but have you come across uh, uh, patterns in practices. So just, just a selfish note, I've seen a number of testimonies of survivors who got themselves Auschwitz tattoo in 1945 when they emerged from hiding. They were not in Auschwitz. And these are, these are tattoos that are part of then being smuggled, right? So um, how much practices like this, which are not documents per se, testimonial, might also be entered into, into your project. But this is just fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. I think um, I actually also have a question for you. So maybe I'll pose it and then we can uh, answer the questions. I'm sorry, I'm trying to see if there's any chat questions. Uh, my question is a bit related to Natalia's. I'm, I think it's a really admirable project you have, and I'm very curious about the logistics of your team and the funding. Who's funding you? And um, how did you find each other? And is it sort of like a, an ongoing, is this a long-term indefinite project? Are you guys angestellt forever? Or is this a three-year project and when it's over, this is gonna be in the internet and then what will happen? So thank you. And perhaps because there's so many questions for you, you want to just start with the answers. We start with uh, each one of us picks one. <laughs> We are, we are not angestellt forever. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm uh, angestellt. I'm uh, sorry, I'm sorry. 
at the U University of Vienna for this specific project. This is my part. Um, you wanted to know how we got together? Yeah. We all come from the uh, theater, film, and media studies at the University of Vienna. So um, we started with the exhibition, yeah, about the history of the uh, theater studies. Um, and then we made a film together with um, interviewing eyewitnesses, Holocaust survivors in Vienna. And then Georg came to us, also because yes, we, we need do. a new uh, cameraman. <laughs> and Georg uh, is also a practiker, so to say, <laughs> film practic. And yes, and so we come together and then Georg has the idea of the video biograph and then he wanted to work um, with Teresa and me, with Teresa and me, um, about the, the, the film project um, of surviving and living, and it's a part of Regio Biograph to this film project. Yes, it's the second use case. Yes. And uh, they, uh, we get also conducted a FWF project on the Institute's ar archive in which we both worked beforehand. So I knew her as an archivist and uh, I came up with the idea because I started to work at the University of St. Bertrand and we are funded a bit differently, but we also we are completely uh, treatmittel funded, so I have to come up with projects. And I also fun funded the Topothek in Groß-Enzersdorf, so this question was around how can we kind of uh, keep up uh, infrastructure and improve it and tell and, and involve people. Because maybe I just, uh, the self-telling archive is kind of uh, uh, maybe a good question to answer next because uh, that's, that's a, an, an issue we have in all those projects because uh, I, I, in my pre-research I, I checked on a lot of the big uh, horizon projects and usually what, what, what stays behind is often a framework of things that should have worked but need people to engage in it. So we try to, try to start it from the other way to bottom up and see who could be the community that actually works in those archives and can we work with them which comes with a plethora of other problems because you need to sustain it and you need to, but, but I think uh, approaching it from the engagement side is interesting. You also get into a lot of problems because you, you need to have uh, some kind of group that kind of self-regulates, so it's important to see what contents get in there. You don't work with scientists, so you have, you have to have rules and you have to have kind of uh, uh, procedures for that, but it was the basic idea to have people that already, and that's the fascinating thing about the, the topotheks in Austria, that they really uh, have always find people in, in, in towns that, that work with that and, and do ongoing research and add material. So that's promising because you have people basically interested in creating and maintaining and, and showing, showing those things. Yes. So that's... Uh, the utopia of, of setting up something uh, that could, uh, where everywhere one could add, like in the topotic, but also could also tell you stories out of this archive would be the long-term utopia. But probably in this project, we'll just get to a prototype that kind of can do it and we'll have to maintain it. And if we want to develop it further, we'll have to do another project. So it's uh, ambitious, but we'll have prototype probably. <laughs> the profession. Ah, the professions, our actor. Performance yes. culture. Yes. So it's not specific performance culture, because. Um, but what we found, there were some actors living in Großenzersdorf or dancers, and then we tried to go deepen in there. What, where were they from? What did they do? Where did they perform? And so on. So that's that point. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other questions you want to? Just, um, yeah, thank you, Anna. You could see that I was, you know, focused more on counting than on reading <laughs> the documents itself. Well, I'm actually trying, what I'm trying to do is to have all the materials that are related to Ukraine so that we have it in the catalog. It was originally in Russian, then in English, and also in Ukrainian. So, you know, one step at a time, one step at a time. Um, what I didn't have time to demonstrate with the documents is that on the basis of our, and reading through our uh, documents, one could see, first of all, who was commemorating the um, victims um, as uh, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s as an act of dissent. And what was the punishment from the authorities for this? And also, which I find absolutely fascinating, uh, is that one could see how uh, Babinia becomes 
the um, um, kind of the synonym of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. So in documents, they don't say the Holocaust, but they say this. And also in the 1990s, um, let's say some um, newspapers in Odessa were writing, oh, this is Babin Yaron, um, see, like I haven't been sleeping uh, properly recently, um, in Odessa. So they don't say the word the Holocaust, but they say Babin Yaron. So I, I truly, like for me, it was a big surprise because I haven't been actually uh, working on this period you know, recently. Oh, not recently, in general. Yay, thank you. Uh, I myself have a question, if we don't, if we don't have time. For okay, yeah, let's uh, answer, no, yeah, you have a question, she has a question too, but we'll go ahead and finish the, yeah. Uh, so, um, definitely I'm the software guy. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'm a quantitative sociologist by training, so uh, that's why. So um, for this project, we just uh, use Excel and very simple things. But uh, when I want to analyze uh, some uh, interrelations between things, then I use SPSS, which is a software, uh, a statistical software, so social, social sciences. And uh, actually, this is a part of a bigger, bigger project, uh, as, as a guy were mentioned, uh, funded by the Rothschild uh, Foundation, and uh, we will analyze um, the textual data of the DIGO files uh, with natural language processing, where we will use Python, uh, and, and that's how we will uh, approach uh, the whole, whole thing. And for Natalia, we have two, questions, two answers. So one comes from, first from, Sandra. Yes, so thank you for the question. Um, I have a different qu answer compared to Iriko because as I mentioned, she's, she's looking into Hungarian survivors in the DP camps or outside of Hungary. And I was looking at uh, Hungarian survivors who came back and well, at least until I could see they, they stayed in Hungary. Um, and an undocumented practice, uh, which I did find a pattern of, was deportees moving and staying together. So there was this tight cohesion among those who survived a camp. And um, they did not mix with even survivors of Budapest, of the ghetto, or, or in hiding. So there was a strong cohesion um, that I found. And... This is visible somewhat also in documentation. So on the Degop files, you could see that sometimes four or five people gave the interview. So gave, and then we have one protocol in the name of several people. That's, that's kind of hinting at this cohesion. But then this was, um, so this I could see was was actually a pattern when when I checked the survivors who did give testimonies in the VHA archives and and they did reflect back to having actually lived together. So when they they couldn't go home, for example, and then they found an apartment in Budapest, whether they were generally from Budapest or not, they would live together. Sometimes even eight, ten people and only those who had been deported previously. Yeah, and uh, thank you also for the question. Uh, one answer is uh, there are a lot of uh, changes with, with uh, birth years. Mm -hmm. uh, the month and the, the, uh, the day normally stays the same. And uh, sometimes also with, with, um, with names, and this goes back to your question that it's very hard, for, for example, for this matching thing. It's very hard to match because uh, the, uh, the names are uh, written differently. And also because Hungarian is a, is a quiet language which, was, which is spoken by a very few people, I would say. Uh, they are really misspelled all the time. And I have a, an interesting case where for this thing, because normally what you see is that uh, after the concentration camp, uh, many people uh, gets younger. 
uh, because it was easy, easier to survive if they lied. But I have a I have an actual uh, case where it happened, uh, and also I I realized that it's the same person. But uh, first his name was Polgar with a P, which go, which is citizen in Hungarian, and the second time it was Bolgar with a B, which is Bulgarian, and uh, the and he also became younger. And I, I, I thought it's just the same story, but I was stuck why the name changed, I don't know. And then I found him in the VHA archive, and it turned out that uh, he wanted to go to Canada for a long time. He couldn't get the visa. And uh, he says in the interview that there was a rumor that uh, if you are an orphan under 18, uh, then you can get a visa. And he says exactly that. And then I became an orphan under 18. And why he changed the name? Because B is up in the alphabet. So he wanted to be in the f beginning of the list and not in the end of the list. So that that's happens quite a lot of times. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Uh, the online uh, panel. Yes, I'd like to. I'd like to answer to, one que to the question of Natalia Alexian. Uh, we had some kind of experiences when we were meeting with survivors after 2012 or 2014. The survivors or their relatives occasionally just refused to donate their family documents to the museum, saying that this is a this is a state museum and the current government. Uh, led by Fidesz, looks doing right-wing popular or anti-Semitic politics, and they occasionally said to us they thought uh, the museum didn't seem to be a safe place or a good place for preserving their family sources anymore. Or they just got sad about it and didn't attend uh, the events and uh, exhibitions of the Memorial Center anymore. So we really experienced uh, the decrease of private donations at that time, which was, I think, obviously was the consequence of the governmental politics at that time. But we are not employed there anymore, so I have no, no new information about it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gabor, are there any questions in the chat? I, I, I haven't seen any, any online questions. Okay. There's um, I, I just want to add something to that, to what Andras and, and Helena presented. Um, one issue with the collection of the Memorial Center is that right from its creation, it hasn't been clarified how would this overlap or contradict or complement the collection policies of the Hungarian Jewish Movement Archives. Let's not forget that uh, a large body of extremely important Holocaust-related materials like the materials of the Jewish Council, for example, are in the Hungarian Jewish Museum and Archives. And Andras and, and Helena are right when they say that the Holocaust Memorial Center is the only um, museum and archive that collects uh, you, uh, uniquely and exclusively Holocaust-related materials, but there's a very large amount, of very relevant core documentation in the, in the Hungarian Jewish Museum and Archives. And as far as I know, um, and, and I was there in the early 2000s when this, this was formulated. Uh, as far as I know, it has never really been clarified where should the survivor go with their materials? Should they go to the Hungarian Jewish Museum archives or should they go to Pavel? So, um, and I think it's quite important that, that after all these decades, I have to say now, that that, that would be clarified because um, you asked about uh, the agency of the donor. Uh, where first of all, the agents, the, the donor should be able to understand what the collection is, where they are going to. And uh, if this is the only collection, there are other options as well. And this is not um, talked about or not discussed or clarified at all, as far as I know, maybe my information are not, my information is not correct. Yes, that's right. And it's not clarified since then. It's true, but uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the comment. <laughs> You're and right. uh, if, if, if I have a, may, may I have a question to, to um, 
Ildi and uh, and Sandra. I don't know. Do we still have time, Julie? Um, yeah, there's one other question from the audience also. There's one more question from Anastasia. So maybe you, why don't I take hers and then you say yours and then sure. we're going to wrap up um, so that we have a break. You have a question also. Okay, two more questions from the audience and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, what's your question? Okay, thank you. Um, shall I again? Okay, fine. Like this. I do have a question to, to Andras Sechini, so I'm speaking there, yeah? Um, I would like to refer to your um, comment on the necessity or maybe uh, the possibility of making the collection more appealing or engaging to for the researchers so that, you know, to, to increase the use of it. But I wonder whether you have come up with any practical solution on how to do it in the um, conditions of decreased funding and in a collection that is in a well, language that is not that um, avail accessible, you know. So because I'm also, we're also having sometimes very um, similar sort of challenges and uh, it still, it remains to be a challenge. So, thank you. Hey, Stina. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I have a question to Helena and Andres. Um, I was really very intrigued uh, about the photograph of porcelain, of porcelain objects that you showed on a slide. And I was wondering, how do practically researchers uh, have access to those objects collected by a research center? Can they kind of also touch them, manipulate them, measure them, et cetera? Or are those objects only accessible as um, via their photographic reproductions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're gonna take Gabor's question and then uh, answers and please make it as quick as possible so that we have a nice half hour break before our keynote speaker. Gabor. So Ildiko and Sandra, you mentioned this concept of researching the silence or exploring the hiatus in, 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 the, in the trajectories of the survivors um, confronting all this documentation. And um, one particular example you mentioned is the question of immigration. Uh, when somebody mentioned or did not mention Palestine. And my question would be, what other stations of the trajectory, what other points of their struggle through the Holocaust do you think uh, these, these silences are talking about? What are the, what are the typical episodes uh, of, of this ordeal uh, that, that could be revealed by, by researching the, the silence or exploring the hiatus? Um, okay, how about the online group answer first? I'd like to answer first, if I can. Yeah. Can I? Thank you. Uh, so both questions uh, concern the accessibility of the, the Holocaust Memorial Center's collection. As a matter of fact, we are not employed anymore in the, in the, of the, uh, in the Holocaust Memorial Center. We have uh, for for four years, yes, I think. So we were talking about just what happened and what was the practice uh, uh, before 2017. But as far as I know, unfortunately, uh, to access to the collection of the or the items of the collection of the August Memorial Center is uh, you can access to it just in person. So it's sad but true. Yes, I um, would like to uh, just one comment. The objects and the photos and other materials are available in the collection. So a researcher can go and uh, ex examine it uh, and research it. But uh, the problem is that the registry of the collections is not available. So the researchers don't know but uh, the collection contains it all. Okay, and Anastasia, Anastasia, your question was to them as well, right? Did they answer that? Okay, all right, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Sandra. Okay, so Sandra. Yes, um, so the question was about other stations or episodes that silences might have the possibility to uncover. Um, 
Yeah, it's a very good question and, you know, hard to answer because it is silences that eventually lead us there, which are still silences now. But for now, what, what I see or what we see in the entire research group with Ildiko is that we are able to, to uncover the bigger picture of, of post-liberation um, life. And today we talked about immigration, obviously, and, and what the practices and hidden practices or undocumented practices of that were. But I think there's also, so we can go further with understanding within immigration Zionist effects, um, propaganda effects of Zionism, which Gabor, you know, um, well, well, you've, you've done the research on Degob materials that there's this answer, and Udi also referred to it, that the, the future travel plans are to Palestine, and that's all we see in the documents, and we do not know the background of how or why these answers were provided, and we really do hope that with our approach, not only the digital way, but also the, the cross-archival examination, we would understand why Palestine or Israel is not mentioned ever again, and Canada, et cetera, are without having documented piece of information from the time of taking Degob interviews. So there might be, we hope at least, there's going to be a glance into that. And if we leave or set aside the immigration, um, I believe we can also look into personal aspects, ways of marrying, remarrying, having children, um, my dissertation at Brandeis is about fertility and reproductive uh, events of the Holocaust and post-Holocaust. And there are several, you know, layers of silences there as well. For the most obvious reason, as the master narrative of the Holocaust did not include these aspects. It was always more about the either the persecution that are known as the main events, but even in, in post-Holocaust terms, there are several aspects, I think, that are left out of Holocaust history in general, and, and we hope to find those. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Gabor, do you want to say anything else before we conclude? Oh, just uh, thanks for the very informative and, and great presentations. I think I've learned a lot today. All right. Thank you. Um, so we're behind a schedule a little bit. We're going to take a 30-minute break. There's coffee and some snacks upstairs. We'll be back here at 6.15. Let's maybe try to be five minutes early um, so that then we can hear our keynote speaker, Natalia. Thank you very much. Thank you.